So glioblastoma is a primary brain tumor um, that originates uh, typically in the brain, um, brain structures. Um, it is in that way different from um, other primary uh, solid tumors, let's say breast cancer or uh, melanoma that can potentially travel to the brain. And uh, this um, kind of means that they, they would constitute a secondary um, brain tumor as opposed to glioblastoma, which is the primary. Um, it is the most common malignant glioma and uh, uh, it's very invasive, uh, very aggressive, and uh, because of that, uh, the prognosis associated with the diagnosis is relatively poor. Uh, there are usually two different types of glioblastoma. We are now understanding uh, more and more about this. Uh, some of them originate from lower grade tumors, lower grade gliomas. Uh, some of them originate de novo. Um, they start as a, a high grade glioma. Um, and we can frequently uh, tell uh, which one um, is which based on the molecular testing that we um, typically uh, attempt uh, in uh, each tumor sample. In my practice, uh, I think I probably see maybe 60, 70 percent of patients with um, primary glioblastoma and uh, maybe 30, 40 percent of patients with secondary glioblastoma. Now, overall survival in uh, glioblastoma, depending again heavily on uh, the molecular status of the tumor can be anywhere from 12 months uh, uh, to you know, over 20 months. Um, again, depends on the molecular status of the tumor, also the treatment provided to the patient. So the typical patient with a glioblastoma in the United States is still a white middle-aged man. Uh, however, it is seen in all age groups. Unfortunately, it is seen in children, um, and uh, it's pretty devastating when it does occur in children. But um, in adults, there is a second peak uh, in the older age group, above 70. Um, the patient's um, risk factors, and people always ask me this too as well, because everybody's always very scared that it's your cell phone that causes it or something they've done to themselves. And what I can say is there's never been any correlation between cell phones, alcohol, tobacco, you know, uh, none of that has ever caused, uh, been shown to be correlated with GBMs. But radiation has been shown. And they know this from the 1950s. Uh, back in uh, Russia, they used to try and treat children um, with uh, radiation for tinea capitis, which is just basically um, a ringworm of the scalp, which is a fungal infection of the scalp. And of course, the fungus died after radiated. And then uh, those children immigrated to Israel as adults, and they were diagnosed with meningiomas and astrocytomas. So that was something that came from the 1950s where we really didn't know too much about radiation. Uh, but nowadays, you know, obviously we don't get radiation exposures like that anymore, so it really is just random bad luck, unfortunately. So the way that the question is, uh, how do the patients present uh, with glioblastoma and what kind of specific symptoms are associated with the newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients? So most of the times, it's interesting, the glioblastoma patients do not present in a dramatic way. Uh, the way in which they present is with a constellation of three different symptoms. Some of them will present with headaches. Most of the patients will actually present with headaches. Uh, second category of patients will present with cognitive problems, memory, speech. And a third category of patients will present with seizures. That is why majority of the patients will present to the office of their primary care doctor or um, their neurologist, and only a minority of the patients will present to the emergency room visits. Uh, so uh, the incidence of glioblastoma is overall increasing. Uh, we are uh, seeing uh, more patients with this condition. Um, also, the, uh, the age of the diagnosis appears to have shifted. Um, it used to be a disease of patients uh, in the 60, 70 years old category. Now we are seeing more and more patients in the late 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, typically, in a typical week, uh, I might see you know, one to two newly diagnosed patients. Uh, um, it sometimes uh, kind of comes in waves. Uh, in, in one week, we can potentially have you know, up to five patients, and then you can, we can have a, another week then when we don't have a case. But on average, it's, it's you know, a one to two cases per week um, in, a, in a large uh, academic center in a large city. Um, and my colleagues also see you know, a similar uh, number of patients. So, so that would be the kind of the average um, number of cases that we, we see.